Hey Bush Kids, we're back for our next lecture here in AP US History. Today we're going to be covering two different topics that are closely tied together. Topic 7.13 and 7.14, World War II, Mobilization, and Aftermath. Our two learning objectives today are 7M and 7N. The first one says, explain the causes and effects of the victory of the United States and its allies over the Axis powers and explain the consequences of U.S. involvement in World War II. Our first key idea says Americans viewed the war as a fight for the survival of freedom and democracy against fascist and military militarist ideologies. This perspective was later reinforced by revelations about Japanese wartime atrocities, Nazi concentration camps, and the Holocaust. Now, we're going to go a little bit out of order in terms of the timeline of everything. So, even before the U.S. officially entered the war, the aims of the U.S. were outlined by FDR. Addressing Congress on January 6, 1941, the President delivered a speech that proposed lending money to Britain for the purchase of U.S. war materials. He justified such a policy by arguing that the United States must help other nations defend four freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Now, as U.S. troops advanced through Germany, they came upon German concentration camps and witnessed the horrifying extent of the Nazis' program of genocide against the Jews and others. Americans and the world were shocked to learn that six million Jewish civilians and several million non-Jews had been systematically murdered by Nazi Germany. We can see some of the horrifying images of those concentration camps in the following images. Now, this reinforced our belief that we were fighting a just war. These feelings were further reinforced by the Japanese treatment of both soldiers and civilians in things such as their treatment of American, British, and Australian POWs, as well as their treatment of Jap uh, Chinese civilians, such as in the rape of Nanjing. Leading us then to key idea number two. The United States and its allies achieved military victory through allied cooperation, technological and scientific advances, the contribution of servicemen and women, and campaigns such as Pacific Island hopping and the D-Day invasion. The use of atomic bombs hastened the end of the war and sparked debates about the morality of using atomic weapons. Now, from 1939 to 1942, the Axis powers dominated North Africa, Europe, and Asia. Now, the high tide of the German advance ended in 1942, partially as a result of U.S. entry into the war, but mainly because of the Soviet victory at Stalingrad in the winter of that year. Now, up to that point, the Germany had used the blitzkrieg tactics to dominate Eastern and Western Europe. Now, England early on was wounded from German attacks in the Battle of Britain, and Hitler had broken the Soviet and Nazi non-aggression pact and marched into Russia during Operation Barbarossa in early 1941. Now, the German and Italian armies had dominated as well North Africa during this time period. They threatened the British Suez Canal, as well as oil fields in the Middle East. Meanwhile, the Japanese dominated Asia. They crippled the U.S. Navy after the Pearl Harbor attack and seized most Western colonies in the Pacific. However, this all changed in the end of 1941, as the U.S. entered the war, and this helped the Allies turn the tide and defeat the Axis by the end of 1945. Now, FDR and Churchill had agreed that defeating Hitler was the top priority, but American troops would be deployed to fight Japan at the same time. We'll focus on the European theater first, although both Europe and the Pacific theater will be happening at the exact same time. Coordinating their military strategy, the British and Americans concentrated on two objectives in 1942. One, overcoming the menace of German submarines in the Atlantic and two, beginning bombing raids on German cities. The protracted naval war to control the shipping lanes was known as the Battle of the Atlantic. German submarines sank over 500 Allied ships in 1942. Gradually, however, the Allies developed ways of containing the submarine menace through the use of radar, 
sonar, the bombing of German naval bases, and the breaking of Germany's coded communications. Now, the Allies had the daunting task of driving German occupying forces out of, the, out of their advanced positions in North Africa and the Mediterranean. They began their North African campaign, known as Operation Torch, in November of 1942. Much to the anger of Joseph Stalin, who had wanted the Allies to open a Western Front to divide the German army. The Allies defeated the Germans at the Battle of El Alamein in 1942, led by U.S. General Dwight Eisenhower and British General Bernard Montgomery. And Allied forces succeeded in taking North Africa from the Germans by 1943. The next U.S.-British target was the Mediterranean island of Sicily, which they occupied in the summer of 1943, preparatory to an invasion of Italy. Mussolini fell from power that summer, but Hitler's forces rescued him and gave him nominal control of northern Italy. In fact, German troops controlled much of Italy at the time that the Allies invaded the peninsula in September of 1943 and the Germans put up a determined resistance to the Allied offensive, holding much of northern Italy until their final surrender in 1945. However, eventually, Mussolini would be caught and captured in 1945 and executed by the Italian resistance, hung upside down. Meanwhile, the Soviet army had stopped the German attack at Moscow and Leningrad in 1942 and the Soviets had also defeated the German army at the Battle of Stalingrad. The victory at Stalingrad was a turning point in World War II because the Russians began pushing towards Germany from the east by 1943. By 1944, the Allies decided to open a Western Front by invading Nazi-occupied France. This Allied drive to liberate France began on June 6, 1944, with the largest invasion by sea in history, named D-Day as part of Operation Overlord. British, Canadian, and U.S. forces under the command of General Eisenhower secured several beachheads on the Normandy coast. After this bloody but successful attack, the Allied offensive moved rapidly to roll back German occupying forces throughout France. By the end of August, Paris was liberated. By September, Allied troops had crossed the German border for a final push towards Berlin. The Germans launched a desperate counterattack in Belgium in December of 1944 or in the Battle of the Bulge. After this setback, however, Americans reorganized and resumed their advance towards Berlin. Now, since 1942, Allied bombing raids over Germany had reduced that nation's industrial capacity and their ability to continue fighting. Recognizing that the end of the war was near as the Russian army closed in on Berlin during the Battle of Berlin, Hitler committed suicide on April 30, 1945. The unconditional surrender of the Nazi armies took place shortly thereafter, or on May 9th of 1945. The world would celebrate VE Day, known as Victory for Europe around the world. However, while the war was coming to an end in Europe, the Allies continued to fight the Japanese in the Pacific. In 1942, the war in the Pacific was dominated by naval forces battling over vast areas. Intercepting and decoding Japanese messages enabled U.S. forces to destroy four Japanese carriers and 300 planes in a decisive battle at Midway from June 4th to June 7th. This battle ended Japanese expansion, and the Allies began to regain islands controlled by the Japanese after this battle. However, like in Europe, the problem for the Allies was the time and, and and troops it would cost to retake the thousands of islands the Japanese controlled in the Pacific. 
So after the victory at Midway, the United States began a long campaign to get within striking distance of Japan's home island by seizing strategic locations in the Pacific. Using a strategy called island hopping, commanders bypassed strongly held Japanese posts and isolated them with naval and air power. Allied forces then moved steadily towards Japan. Therefore, from 1943 to 1945, the Allies took back the Philippines and were moving in on Japan. Now, Japan did not play by the traditional rules of war. For instance, at the Battle of Lady Gulf in October 1944, the Japanese Navy was virtually destroyed. But for the first time in the war, the Japanese used what were called kamikaze pilots to make suicide attacks on U.S. ships. In addition to this, Japanese soldiers oftentimes refused to surrender or they tortured Allied prisoners of war. Kamikazes also inflicted major damage at the colossal Battle of Okinawa from April to June of 1945 before finally succeeding in taking the island near Japan. U.S. forces suffered nearly 50,000 casualties while killing 100,000 Japanese. At the Battle of Iwo Jima, uh, American forces for the first time um, were able to kill more Japanese than they were able to, uh, that they suffered of their own. Now, from these islands of both Iwo Jima and Okinawa, the U.S. began an intense firebombing campaign of Japanese cities, including the firebombing of Tokyo, which killed nearly 135,000 Japanese civilians. It was, in fact, more deadly than the bombings of Hiroshima and the bombing at Nagasaki later on. This would factor into the debate about the morality of the war after our use of those nuclear weapons. Now, despite losing control of the Pacific and withstanding firebomb attacks, Japan continued to refuse to surrender. And by May of 1945, the war in Europe was over and the U.S. began preparing for a land invasion of Japan. A huge invasion force stood ready to attack Japan, but extremely heavy casualties were feared. Science, though, would come to the rescue. In 1939, Albert Einstein, pictured in the bottom there, wrote to the U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt about the potential to build a nuclear weapon. That letter is on the right-hand side. As a result, FDR will create a top-secret program called the Manhattan Project. Now, Einstein won't run the project. Instead, it will be run by Robert Oppenheimer, who was put in charge of developing the bomb. From 1942 to 1945, a number of secret labs across the country helped to develop and build the bomb. Um, with nearly 100,000 people working on the construction of it and nearly $2 billion spent to develop the two different styles of the weapon. Those are just a few of the locations at Chicago at the Fermi Institute, where physicist Enrico Fermi developed the nuclear reaction, to a nuclear plant at Hanford, Washington that developed the plutonium, to the bomb actually con being constructed at a secret city in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and finally a, where the first successful test was carried out at Los Alamos, uh, was what was called Project Trinity at New, in the New Mexico desert. By the way, right there is the actual bomb and the picture of the explosion of it going off. Now, in April 1945, FDR had passed away, and his vice president, Harry Truman, had to decide how to end the war in the Pacific. While he was having to decide, in not July of 1945, what were called the Big Three, that's Winston Churchill that you see here, or Harry S. Truman here, and Joseph Stalin here, were meeting at a conference in Potsdam to discuss the end of World War II. Now, Truman learned the atomic bomb was ready and issued the Potsdam de Declaration to Japan to surrender or face destruction. When Japan refused to surrender, Truman ordered the bombing of Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. The results of that destruction you can see in the picture on the upper right-hand side. The blast 
generated ground temperatures of nearly 7,000 degrees, hurricane force winds of 980 miles per hour, releasing an energy equivalent to 20,000 tons of TNT. 70,000 people would be killed immediately, and 140,000 people would die by the end of 1945. The death toll reached approximately 200,000 people eventually. Japan, not knowing what had hit it, refused to surrender. After three days, Truman ordered the dropping of a second atomic bomb, nicknamed Fat Man, on the city of Nagasaki. The destruction at Nagasaki, you can see pictured on the right. After the second atomic bomb, Emperor Hirohito agreed to finally surrender. World War II was finally over. Leading us to key idea number three. Military service provided opportunities for women and minorities to improve their socioeconomic positions for the war's duration, while also leading to debates over racial segregation. Now, the war changed the lives of women. Over 200,000 women will serve in uniform in the Army, Navy, and Marines, but in non-combat roles. Women in uniform took office and clerical jobs in the armed forces in order to free men to fight. They also drove trucks, repaired airplanes, worked in lab as laboratory technicians, rigged parachutes, served as radio operators, analyzed photographs, flew military aircraft across the country, test flew newly repaired planes, and even trained anti-aircraft artillery gunners by acting as flying targets. Here's just a few other pictures of their inclusion. Now, some women served near front lines in the Army Nurse Corps, where 16 were killed as a result of direct enemy fire. Uh, 68 American service women were captured as POWs in the Philippines. More than 1,600 nurses were decorated for bravery under fire and meritorious service. And 565 WACs in the Pacific Theater won combat decorations. The nurses were in Normandy on D plus 4. Now, the manpower of black soldiers was needed in order to win the war as well. But the military brass got its way. America's Jim Crow order was to be upheld. African Americans were allowed to train as pilots and the segregated Tuskegee Airmen. And the 92nd Buffalo Soldiers and the 93rd Blue Helmets, that's all black divisions, were activated and sent abroad under the command of white officers. Now, despite these concessions, 90% of black troops were forced to serve in labor and supply units, rather than the more prestigious combat units. Except for a few short weeks during the Battle of the Bulge in the winter of 1944, when commanders were desperate for manpower, all U.S. soldiers served in strictly segregated units. Even the blood banks were segregated. In addition, many Mexican-American worked in defense industries, and over 300,000 served in the military. A 1942 agreement with Mexico allowed Mexican farm workers known as Baracos to enter the United States in the harvest season without going through formal immigration procedures. Finally, American Indians also contributed to the war effort. Approximately 25,000 would serve in the military, and thousands more worked in defense industries. Having discovered the opportunities off their reservations, more than half never returned. Now, the most famous were the Navajo co Code Talkers, who created a code based on a complex, unwritten Navajo language. The code primarily, primarily used word association by assigning a Navajo word to key phrases and military tactics. Leading us, finally, to key idea number four. The war ravaged conditions of Asia and Europe and the dominant U.S. role in the Allied victory and post-war peace settlements allowed the United States to emerge from the war as the most powerful nation on Earth. In February 1945, the Big Three met at the Yalta Conference to create a plan for Europe after the war was over. Stalin had agreed to send troops to help the U.S. invade Japan, and they also agreed at the Yalta Conference to allow self-determination, that means free elections, and nations freed from Nazi rule. In addition, they were going to occupy Germany after the war. They also agreed to create and join a new United Nations that would replace the now defunct League of Nations.
In addition, the war also changed the United States. World War II was the biggest and deadliest war in world history. Okay. With nearly 10 million dead in World War I, 51 million are going to be killed during World War II. And it was incredibly impactful. We can see how the, the USSR is going to be negatively impacted with the most deaths during World War II. Germany, and Japan, and the British Empire suffering the next, with the United States still barely scarred. Generally, Europe was destroyed by the war and lost its place as the epicenter of power in the world. The USA and the USSR emerged as superpowers and rivals for competing for an influence in the war. The world. A United Nations was formed to replace the League of Nations to help promote world peace, and colonized nations began to demand independence from Europe. In addition, the United States emerged as the most powerful nation on, in the world, controlling most of the world's gold stocks, most of the world's manufacturing, as well as the world's largest military. Well, that ends our discussion of World War II. What we've covered today is we've talked about how uh, the different ideologies of, for fighting the war, those four freedoms, were reinforced by a Nazi German uh, techniques such as the Holocaust, as well as Japanese treatment of both POWs and civilians. We've also talked about our strategy both in Europe uh, and major battles including D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge and our actions against Japan, our island hopping strategies, as well as our decision to use the atomic weapon. We've also discussed how uh, the war impacted different minority groups such as women, African Americans, uh, Mexican Americans, and Native Americans how technology played an important part in the winning of the war, and how at the end of the war, our settlements such as at Yalta will set the, post, the framework for the post-war world, and how we as a country emerge as the most powerful nation on earth. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button, and until next time, and as always, Go Pack!